Welcome to Icons, Mary, episode six. We are continuing to discuss on the character of Mary. I'm sure there are a lot more insights and a lot more things to be understood on this character of Mary. Let's go in for the first call today. We will take the first call, Father. Thank you for calling, Divine. Uh, my name is Anto. I'm calling from Alepi. Yes, Anto. And uh, my question is, why do we call Mary the mother of God? Uh -huh. Is it not a source of misunderstanding? Is it not better to call Mary the mother of the Messiah? All right. So your, your question is, why do we call Mary as the mother of God? And is, is that a kind of a misunderstanding? Yes. And you also say that it would be better if it's called, uh, if she is called the mother of the Messiah, right? Yes. All right, Anto. We'll answer that question for you. Thanks for calling. You have a great day. Anto. Thank you very much. Father, so this is a, why mother of God? Now, to call Mary the mother of God, at first sight, that is a source of confusion. Mm -hmm. Because Mary will be greater than God. Because she is the one who gave existence to God as the mother of God. No? Mm -hmm. But why the church calls Mary as the mother of God is precisely on the understanding of scriptures. Right. Because it is said about Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the same thing is repeated by Paul in a different way. Mm -hmm. In the letter to the Galatians, chapter 4, verse 4. Mm -hmm. In the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Mm -hmm. Therefore, who is this person? Mm -hmm. That is the son of God, who was with the father. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the person of Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. Right. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the, that child to whom Mary gave birth is the son of God. Mm -hmm. And therefore, with every sense of that word, we can speak her, speak of her as the mother of God. Mm -hmm. Because when we say that Mary is the mother of God, we mean thereby that she is the one who gave Jesus the earthly existence in the human form. Mm -hmm. So, not in the sense of his pre-existence. Mm -hmm. Because we know, that is our faith, Jesus, as the second person of the Trinity, pre-existed his incarnation. And that is why John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. But this Word became flesh. Mm -hmm. So, in the process of becoming flesh, Mary is an instrument, and that, that person, you cannot make a, make a kind of split into that person. So, there is only one person in Jesus. And that right. is the first, second person of the Trinity. And that's, what, that's the reason why we speak of Mary as the mother of God. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it is true that one who doesn't understand all these implications about the Trinitarian understanding of God, etc., it is a source of confusion. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Mary is also the mother of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Because this child who is born of Mary is the son of God and Messiah. Right. And that is why in chapter 2 of the Acts of the Apostles, mm -hmm. on the day of Pentecost, Peter, in his first sermon speech, your fathers have put Jesus of Nazareth to death, mm -hmm. but God has raised him and made him, in Greek, Christos and Kyrios. Mm -hmm. Christos is Messiah, that's the Greek word, mm -hmm. and Kyrios is the word for God in a, according to the Septuagint version of the Old Testament translation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when Peter says, this Jesus is now Christos, that is the Messiah, and Kyrios, Kyrios is actually the term that is used for God in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Testament. Right. Mm. And that's why the Jesus is Messiah and God. Mm. And then Mary as the, Messiah, as the mother of the Messiah and God. Right. Mm. And therefore, uh, when we speak of Mary as the mother of God, we should be very clear, not in the sense that she is the one who gave existence to the second person of the Trinity from all eternity. No. Channel. Yeah. Therefore, this is in the plan of the incarnation that mm. she has been instrumental to mm. bring this child into this world as a mother. Right. In that sense. I think the, the, the way it's, it's very evident that, yes. you know, she's yes. called the mother of God only after we know that Jesus is God. Correct. Not before that. No. Nowhere in the Bible it says, mm. you know, she's the one yes. who's the mother of God because of which God became God. Yes. Mm. So it's because he is God yes. and he was born as a human flesh, yeah. in human flesh. Yeah. She's called the mother of God. Yeah. I think that, that brings you know. And that's why in the language theology, it is said, Mariology is from Christology. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Christology comes first. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Our understanding of who Jesus Christ is. It yeah. is from here that we go to Mariology about Mary. It's more of Mary for Jesus rather than yeah. Jesus for Mary. Yeah. You have something to ask on that? I was, uh, you know, thinking about the point where Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Yeah. And so that makes them God, both of them God. It's like the Trinity yeah. that you said. Yeah. And also even in um, when Mother Mary visits Elizabeth, she yeah. said, how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Oh, yeah. There yeah. itself... Mother Mary has been declared as a mother, as of, mother God. of God. Yeah, yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. So it is not we who call Mary as the mother of God first. Absolutely. It is Elizabeth. And it is said about Elizabeth. Elizabeth, being filled with the Holy Spirit, said, How is it that the mother of my, my, my God is visiting? Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is only with the help of the Holy Spirit yes. that one can understand Mary as the mother of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. I have a question. I, mean, uh, I wouldn't say it's complicated, but then the, the yeah. question is like this like, how do you actually? Uh, pastor people or teach people mm. the, the the balance of the character between Mary and Jesus because there's a lot of uh, you understand what I'm saying there's yeah, yeah, a lot of mix you know in the Especially popular the, piety yeah. perhaps Mary is more important than Jesus absolutely <laughs> because there's a kind of feminine touch there absolutely. and we all feel very happy to go to the mother yes I mean that's actually from the human uh, popular point of view but then we have to base our spirituality and our prayer life on the word of God because that is actually a source of spirituality but what does the word speak? We, as we have seen some time back, Mary tells you, do whatever he tells you. Right. Not that whatever I tell you, mm -hmm. but do whatever he tells you. So Mary is always pointing to Jesus. Right. And therefore, uh, how to make the proper balance between Christology and Mariology? It is actually to explain. And that is actually the meaning of studying the word in its depth. Right, right. So it's more of that understanding that people need to get that, yeah. you know, when they are actually venerating Mary, yeah. they are not actually going against the will of God. Yeah. Rather, it, it leads yeah. to the, you know, exaltation of Christ at the end of the yeah. day. Correct. So that understanding, I, I think we, we have to give a deeper insight and a teaching to people because yeah. they'll be able to f combat some forces which are... Yeah, that's precisely yeah. what we are doing actually. Yeah. We are trying yeah. to explain the word of God to the people. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, All right. Father, in questions? that case, say, you know, there are many people who are very comfortable with, uh, you know, doing what he tells you, huh. going to Christ first. Yeah. Mm. So where does Mary fit into this picture now? If going to Mary mm. is a help for us to come close to him, by all means do that. Mm. And as you said rightly, there are some people who do not feel the need of this. Therefore, by all means, they can go straight to Christ. Mm. And the Catholic Church does not say that you have to venerate Mary. All what the church says, veneration of Mary is not against the scriptures. Mm. Mm. Can you define veneration for us? Father? Veneration mm. means actually. Now, Mary herself says in chapter 1 of Luke's Gospel, from now onwards, all the generations will call me blessed. Yes. And therefore, calling Mary blessed Mm -hmm. is a duty for all believers whether he or she is a Catholic or a Protestant or an Orthodox or a Mathomite. It is all, that's why filled with the Holy Spirit Mary is saying from now on all generations will call me blessed. Mm -hmm. And what are we doing actually when we are venerating or praying to Mary? Hail Mary, full of grace. With the most uh, fundamental prayer to Mary. You know? mm -hmm. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with you. And therefore by qualifying or saying Mary, Hail we are saying that you are the blessed one. Mm. You know, in that aspect of saying that you are the blessed one, you know, that uh, requires some sort of explanation of the word, the very prayer, Hail Mary, you know. In, in fact, we know the first part of that prayer is fully biblical. It is taken from the gospel. Yes. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Mm. And then this is said by the uh, angel, angel Gabriel. Mm. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus said by Elizabeth. Elizabeth yes. And then the second part, Holy Mary, Mother of God. Holy Mary is actually, that is an implication of what the angels have greeted her. Mm -hmm. The one who is highly favored by God, above your holy, Mother of God. Mm -hmm. Again, said by Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Pray for us sinners. That we are all sinners is the datum of the scriptures from the very beginning. Yes. Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Now, what is actually the aspect of praying for Sometimes like we have always said what is the relevance of intercession or the saints praying for us, etc. Mm. And now the saints praying for us, that again is scriptural. I think that in one of our yes. episodes we have already explained that. Already in the Old Testament, in the second book of Maccabees, chapter 15, mm. there is a vision which Judas is giving. That is, Onias the high priest 
and Jeremiah the prophet. They are praying for the people of God in heaven. Mm-hmm. Well, that is the vision that Judas is having. So that is in the second book of Maccabees in the Old Testament. That means already in the Old Testament, that faith was there that people who have lived here once, mm-hmm. Eli, there's Onias, who was the high priest of the Jews of the third century, and then Jeremiah, who was a prophet of the sixth century, yeah. they're all dead and gone, they're in eternity, yeah. and they are pe- playing for the people of God in heaven. Mm-hmm. That means there is an aspect of intercession yeah. by those who have gone ahead of us. So this is actually the basis, one of the basis for uh, the believing in the intercession of saints. So likewise, applying that aspect of intercession of saints for us, mm-hmm. already from the Old Testament, connecting it with what Mary did during the marriage feast of Cana, mm-hmm. and again, whom Je- Jesus gave as our mother, intercessor, in chapter 19 of John's Gospel, mm-hmm. putting all these things together, and above all, the fact that we are constituting one communion, one family, mm-hmm. and that is the basis for believing in the intercession of Mary. Mm-hmm. And then we say, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Therefore, once we understand correctly, Mary will not deviate you mm. from Christ. On the contrary, she will lead you more and more. Mm. And now you ask about veneration, venerating Mary. Then thinking about Mary and extolling her mm. and in her own words, calling her blessed. And above all, looking at her life and trying to live a life of faith, mm. hope and charity. This is the meaning of veneration of saints. Unfortunately, what most of us perhaps in the popular piety we are doing is we are asking for this thing, for that thing, etc. Mm. But okay, that is one aspect of approaching Mary, mm. but that is not the most important. Mm. Also, I feel um, as you were speaking, you know, I suddenly thought that it's like about children growing up in a household where there is both a father and a mother. Huh. So in our spiritual upbringing, mm. uh, there must be an aspect of this mother, you know, where otherwise your spiritual growth may be incomplete, though you may look healthy on yeah, the outside. Yeah. There must be some something lacking. Some maybe. sort of feminine touch we can yeah, call yeah. it. Of course, in the I don't know. Life, maybe I, being a woman, I I feel favorable or what? I'm not sure. The, the, you are perfectly right in the sense, you know, because we are approaching God as human beings, mm. right? And that elevation of the masculine dimension and feminine dimension that is there also in our spiritual life. And therefore, if devotion to Mary helps us in that kind of things, why should we say no to that? Mm. It does not go against our faith in Christ. Yeah. Far from that. Mm. And it is God himself, Holy Spirit himself, who says that all generations has to call her blessed. Mm. Mm-hmm. And that we also find in the life of the early church. Because the apostles were remaining united with Mary in prayer mm. for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Because after the ascension of the Lord, because they were praying with Mary. Mm. So Mary was helping the early church and that she continues. Mm. I think I'll be more happy to say when God says, like a mother comforts you, I'll comfort you. And yeah. that is shown in yeah. Mary actually. Yeah. Yeah. It is found in Mary. Yeah. Like. I think we have a mail that uh, Dave can present it for us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Father, why do the Catholics believe in immaculate conception of Mary? So for that, we have to understand first, what is the meaning of Immaculate Conception? Yes. Right. It is actually one of the dogmas of the church, which was proclaimed as an article of faith by Pope Pius IX in 1854. Then people may ask, was not this belief existing in the church before that? Mm. Then we have to understand correctly from the historical evolution of this understanding of Mary's Immaculate Conception. In 1854, when Pope Pius IX declared the Immaculate Conception as an article of faith, the wording was like this. The Blessed Virgin Mary, by a unique favor or privilege of God, she was exempt from the original sin. Original sin as understood in the traditional uh, Catholic theology. Mm. So that Mary was immune from original sin. Now, why do we say that? For that, again, we have to go to the scriptures. According to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 28, the angel Gabriel, when the angel comes and greets Mary, in Greek, I'm going to quote Greek, the angel said, the Gospel he said, Kaire kekari tomene ho curios metasu. Hail, but all the translations are defective. It is said, hail full of grace. I mean, that is not actually the right translation. 
കെക്കാരി തോമനെ ഇസ് എ പാസീവ് പാർട്ടിസിപ്പിൾ ഓഫ് ദാറ്റ് വേർബ് ഒറിജിനൽ വേൺ ദോ ദ റിയൽ ലിറ്ററൽ ട്രാൻസ്ലേഷൻ വിൽ ബി ഹെയിൽ ദ വൺ ഹു ഈസ് ഫിൽഡ് വിത്ത് ഗ്രേസ് ദ ലോഡ് ഈസ് വിത്ത് യു ആൻഡ് ദേ ഫോർ ദ വൺ ഹു ഈസ് ഫിൽഡ് വിത്ത് ഗ്രേസ് ഇറ്റ്സ് എ പാസീവ് പാർട്ടിസിപ്പിൾ ഖാരിസ് ഗ്രേസ് ഈസ് ദറ്റ് ഗ്രേസ് ഖാരിസ് ഇൻ ഇൻ ഗ്രീക്ക് ഈസ് ദ അൺമെറിറ്റഡ് ബെലവോളൻസ് ഓഫ് ഗോഡ് അക്കോർഡിംഗ് ടു ദ പൗളൈൻ അണ്ടർസ്റ്റാൻഡിങ് ദാറ്റ് മീൻസ് God was showering upon Mary this unmerited grace and that is why the angel is saying hail the one who is highly favored by God the Lord is with you mm-hmm. that when was Mary favored and that we have to see again with the help of another text that we have already spoken of here according to the book of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 it is said I will create enmity between you and the woman and the woman's seed and your seed and he will crush the head of the serpent mm. and therefore there was a constant enmity between this woman and the serpent the serpent is a symbol of evil or sin that means mary has not yielded to the serp- to the serpent right. not even for a minute that means she has in put in very categorical terms she has not committed any sin mm. and that is again because of the grace of god so putting all these things that mary was highly favored by grace that the church believes from the very beginning of her, her existence and not only that in the tradition from the early church mary was qualified in the greek tradition as pan hagia in greek that means all holy therefore there was a belief in the early church that mary was all holy that means immune from all sins therefore this faith of the early church that mary was all holy not because of any merit of hers but because of the favor of god and that is why she is only, only a passive instrument there because god has acted and that is why pope nine the pope the pastor nine said by a singular favor god made her immune mm. and this is the basis or scriptural basis based on tradition that mary is considered as the one who is immune from sin and immaculate conception simply means that she is the one who is immune from the original sin to which we all are subject and mary was immune from original sin and habitual sin because the one all who is all holy that is god who is going to be born of this woman mm-hmm. it was only fit in the fitness of things that she be also holy yeah. and therefore you know when we when we speak of mary as the immaculate immaculately conceived one that is that is actually we are extolling what god has done yeah. so it is not a quality of mary, mary. in the sense but it is because god has given this favor and again the grace the initiative is from god and that's why it is because of a singular favor from god based on luke 128 genesis 315 and also the tradition of the church pan hagia from the beginning mm-hmm. looking at mary as the one who was pure immaculate without sin and putting all these things in 1854 pius the 9th proclaimed that this is a article of faith mm. so it was already there as part of the faith of the church but now uh, in course of time it's a, a typical example of the evolution of the faith so yeah. to say and that is why only in the 19th century it was declared but much before that mary was con- uh, considered as a, as a as a person without sin many people misunderstand jesus to be the immaculate conception is it no, father no, no, no. of course jesus is a, 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 a naturally what is it? jesus also did not have original sin yes so from that point of view but only when to... we refer as a immaculate conception it's actually mary that we are talking yeah, it is about yeah it's mary because it was a preparation for the coming of his son yeah so because jesus was to be born from mary yeah. so on god's part because you know that uh, in the language of paul in the fullness of time god sent his son born of a woman and this born was this woman was prepared like this mm. and that is actually a privilege and attribute that is given to mary in view of jesus birth mm. incarnation i think if a, if a vessel has to hold something clean it has to be made yeah, clean so yeah for us to give us a good example <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, i think that that solves a lot of uh, confusions father i also have this question on the 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 growth of the bible for mm. example the the catholic church has got mm. seven more books yeah so as we discussed about the the book of maccabees some time ago there are a lot of 
uh, new revelations that come. I mean, I mean, the church is rich in wisdom because uh, we know that it's the pillar and foundation of the truth. Yeah. And they do such amount of research mm. and such amount of time that goes into it, mm. which I think the the uh, the other churches or the other denominations really lack this. Mm. Uh, what actually brought them to that place of stagnance mm. that they said, this is it, mm. and after this, we're not going to believe anything more. Okay. You add 1,000 more books, we're still not going to believe. What mm. caused this, actually? I mean, it's, it, it's not out of context, but then still, I want to ask this question. All right, now, as far as the evolution of the number of books that we have to see, a lot of history is behind it, uh -huh. because we had you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, 46 books, and in the New Testament, 27. So, according to the Catholic understanding, the Bible is a library, it's a collection of 73 books. But then our Protestant brethren, uh, they have only 39 books in the Old Testament. They do not have seven of these books. Mm -hmm. These seven books are called the so-called deuterocanonical books. Right. Mm -hmm. And now, what is the history? Now, did the church have these books from the very beginning? Mm -hmm. Or the better question will be, did the Jews have all these books? Because we have taken the Old Testament from the Jews. Perfect. Because as far as the Christians are concerned, there is no difference as far as the number of books are concerned about the New Testament. Mm. The Protestants and the Catholics, they all have 27 books. That is clear. Mm. So what about these seven books? Right. Now, this is a big history and a lot of dispute is there. Mm. Now, we have to say that there, are, there were two canons of the Old Testament at the time of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, to explain it in a very brief way, they are called Alexandrian canon and Palestinian canon. Right. Alexandrian canon means that was the set of books that were used by the Jews outside Palestine. Mm -hmm. You know, by means of the, the Babylonian exile and the Assyrian captivity. Assyrian captivity was in 722 BC and Babylonian captivity was in 587. There were more Jews living outside Palestine than inside. Mm -hmm. And in course of time, these Jews living outside Palestine could not understand Hebrew. And therefore the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek. And that translation is called Septuagint. So mm -hmm. all the books of the Hebrew Bible, they were translated into Greek. Greek. Mm -hmm. And the people living outside Palestine were using that. But then the thing is, the Greek, the Jewish people who were living outside Palestine had in their canon, not only the translation of the Hebrew books, but they also had some Greek books in the original. Mm -hmm. So books like Wisdom, Prophecy is there, then Ecclesiastes, etc. Mm -hmm. These were books which were written originally in Greek and used by the Jews living outside Palestine. Mm -hmm. So now this list of books is called the Alexandrian Canon. Yeah. Okay. And that means there were more books in the Alexandrian Canon than in the list of books which were used by the Jews in Palestine. Mm -hmm. right. So the Palestinian Canon is that list of books which were used by the Jews in Palestine. So that's why we say at the time of Jesus, there were two canons. Canon means the official list of the books. Right. One is the Alexandrian canon and the Palestinian canon. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is, which canon did Jesus and the apostles use? Right. <laughs> as far as Jesus is concerned, we know that we have the example, Jesus was using the book of Isaiah right. in chapter 4 yes. of the, book, the Gospel yes. of Luke. Of course, we don't know which translation he was Most probably he was using a Hebrew Bible or an Aramaic being in Palestine. Right, right. But then, what about the apostles? That's the important thing. Mm. You know, the mm. apostles were using the Greek Septuagint. Why right. do we say that? Mm. Because in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew is quoting, while speaking about the incarnation, this was to fulfill what the prophet has said, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, etc. In chapter 1 of Matthew's Gospel, there he is quoting the Septuagint version, the Greek version. Mm. That means the apostles were using that bigger canon, the longer canon, mm. that is the Alexandrian canon. Mm. So that was actually in use till the 16th century by Whoa. Christians. Whoa. And that is why not only the Catholics, but also the Oriental Orthodox, mm -hmm. the non-Catholic Orientals, yes. they also are using the so-called deuterocanonical books, that is mm. the longer canon. Mm. Then what happened in the 16th century? In the 16th century, Martin Luther, mm. with the Protestant Reformation, Mm. Then, of course, you want to reform the church. Mm. And we should also say, there were certain abuses in the church, to be honest to history, right. which were based on some of the hints in the deuterocanonical books. Oh, oh. For example, the prayer to the saints, mm. prayer for the dead, 
all those things are coming in the book of Maccabees, right. which is part of the so-called deuterocanonical books. Mm. And on the basis of this uh, veneration of saints, mm. praying for the dead, indulgences, etc., mm. that was actually a real abuse in the church. And Martin Luther, he wanted to purify the church of all these abuses. Mm-hmm. And then he found these abuses have crept in the church on the basis of certain indications in these books. Yes. The best thing is to, to throw away these books. Oh, oh, oh. And that's why it is Martin Luther in the 16th century who said these books we don't accept. Oh, oh. The primary reason was because of some abuses on the basis of these books. The books are not responsible. As I told you, the sale of indulgence for the construction of the St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, mm. and uh, devotion to saints and all kinds of things, relics, pilgrimages, and uh, the popular piety misused actually some of the indications there. Therefore, Luther said, we are not going to take this. That was another thing. Luther said, the, Jew, the Old Testament is the book of the Jews. Mm. And the Jewish people, it is true in Palestine, today, they are not using actually the deuterocanonical books. They are only using the Palestinian book, the canon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then Luther said, the Jewish people are not using the deuterocanonical books. Mm. The Old Testament is the book of the Jews. Therefore, we shall take only those books which are accepted by the Jewish Two people. Oh, oh, okay. And that was another reason. But now, we have to thank a stray sheep for proving that what Luther said is wrong. Mm. Because his argument was, in Palestine, at the time of Jesus or even before that, these deuterocanonical books were not used. But that was found to be wrong by a discovery that was made in the Judean desert, the so-called oh. Qumran documents. Mm. In 1946, yes, yes. the Qumran do- finding is clear. Yes. An Arab shepherd, mm. while looking for one of his stray sheep, then he came across some, stro- some scrolls. And among those scrolls, there were fragments of these deuterocanonical books. And these were books which were used by the Qumran community in Palestine. And the Qumran community was there from the 2nd century BC up to the 2nd century AD. For about 400 years they were there. And the Qumran community was the cream of the society, of the Jewish people. Mm. The so-called the pious ones. Wow. That means the Qumran community, which is the pious group of the Jewish people, they were using these books. Mm. And Martin Luther was saying that the Jewish people were not using it. Mm. And therefore, a stray sheep, mm. that sheep proved mm. that the Jews were using this. And again, majority of the Jews... And in fact, at the time of Jesus, the number of the diaspora Jews, that means Jewish people who are living outside, outside Palestine, Palestine, it is almost 10 times more than the Jews in Palestine. Right. Supposing there were 100 Jews, and uh, therefore 10 Jews only in Palestine, and 90 were outside. That means 90 Jews were using the deuterocanonical books, and 10 only were using the so-called Palestinian. Right. And another thing, significant thing is, it was in the second century AD, 2nd century AD, that the Jewish people finally decided upon what canon to follow. Because in the 1st century of Christianity, the church had already accepted the so-called Alexandrian canon. Mm. Okay. Then the Jewish rabbi said, since the Christian churches have accepted Alexandrian canon, we are not going to accept that. <laughs> we are going to accept the Palestinian canon. That is why in AD 135, 2nd century, during the Council of Jamnia, it is said, the Jewish rabbis they came together for a conference, for a council, and then decided that we shall follow only the Palestinian canon. And that is the reason that the present-day Jews also have only 39 books. But we should remember, under the 2nd century, the Jews were also using these books. Mm. Till the 16th century, all the Christians were using it. So this is the history of the so-called Palestinian canon, shorter list, 39 books, and the Alexandrian canon, 46 books, used by the Catholic Church and also the Oriental Orthodox Churches. Beautiful, beautiful. So that's, that's, that's so much of knowledge in there. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, because, you know, we just we, we just have this kind of domestic fights saying that, hey, you have more books, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you don't want to use that. Yeah. But then the history behind that is so yeah. awesome because if you don't know these things, yeah. we'll not. it's not about talking to others, but we ourselves are not educated. Yeah. It's really good. We are discussing the character of Mary, and we see that so much of clarity uh, we wish that everyone watches this program because, you know, there's, there's so many things which we do not know, which we have to know, are being discussed out here. TV Meets in another episode. God bless you all.